Good evening, everybody out there. Oh, I think I blew my eardrums off. Guys, it's good to be with you this evening. Well, we're going to talk about a very good subject tonight. Very good subject. The harvest. How many of you know about the harvest? I'll tell you something. The harvest is the number one. The number one topic of this week. I can almost guarantee that everything is going to relate to the harvest. Guarantee that. We'll get into that. I want someone to keep a uh, a date log. Today is day one. Day one. And we have 40. Don't ask. Keep count. Today is day one. We have 40 days. So let's... Uh, do what we can do within that time so that we can be prepped and ready and prepared. Don't ask, but today is day one. All right, guys, tonight we talk about the harvest. Of course, that comes out of Revelation 14. It is a ongoing theme in the book of Revelation from 14 going forward. It is a very expansive subject. It is. It's quite clear, too. But there's something you may not know something you may not know see there's something everybody somewhat talks about they don't like not realizing it is the number one sign of all times we're going to talk about the number one sign of all times tonight we're going to do that folks i hope that everything is communicated quite clearly right i do Hope that you guys have your Bibles open. I do. Because all of us are in this. So let's get started, shall we? Revelation 14, you guys joined me last time we read. We were talking about the uh, three angels, right? Three angels. That was Revelation 14, 6 through 14, 13. Tonight we're going to read, starting Revelation 14, 14. And we'll go forward from there. Now, there will be some embedded subjects involved. I'm not sure how long that will take. I really am not. So, you guys, uh, if I start going too long, all right, just let me know. We don't want to wear anybody out. All right. Revelation 14, 14. You guys ready? Let's go. Also, some of you guys who you, you like to minister, get yourselves ready. Get yourselves ready. See, when I was somewhat under the weather, I got quite a bit done in the background. More than I ever thought I would get done. Somehow that happened. Right? It did. And uh, that means we are we're on track. Right? I want you guys to continue to pray. Continue to pray for COT. Because every time we get close to being on track, right? Obstacles come. This time, let's make it different. I want you guys to pray for COT that we can continue to go forward with the word of God, but stronger than before, all right? In his spirit, in the spirit of the Lord to make an actual difference. While everybody else out there, just, just saying, a lot of people out there, they are complaining about things and fighting and feuding. We're not going to do that. We're going to dare to make a difference as per the instructions of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the avenues. We have the technology, right? We do. We certainly have the will. We have the wherewithal. All we need is a blessing to continue to go forward. Prayer to fight through obstacles that may rise. Because they will. Anywhere the word of God is found, you're going to find Satan trying to hold it back. You will. That means he works through people, right? So that means all of us, all of us, we have to remain vigilant. Watching ourselves, watching each other, right, to encourage. Make sure no one gets depressed. And any one of you, any one of you who is not at that level where you're not depressed, somebody needs to know about it, right? That's an emergency, I would say, inside of COT. That's an emergency. We all need to be on that uh, similar level. We all do. 
Now that we have that out of the way, Revelation 14, 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud, one that sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. This uh, description kind of looks like Christ, right? One that sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle, right? Let's continue. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Oh boy. The harvest of the earth being ripe is when everything changes. Everything. Everything. Let's continue to read because we're going to have to go back piece by piece and go into these uh, verses. And he that, he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth. The earth was reaped and another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had the power over fire and he cried with a loud cry to him that's, that had the sharp sickle saying thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's a lot of uh, blood there, right? Now we can see the same thing mirrored. Speaking at the end of this, we can see the same thing mirrored in the Book of Isaiah. Same exact thing. Let's continue to read. We're 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 on fifteen. We have to read this first, and then we'll start to go back. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having harps, having the harps of God. Now that, listen, if, if those people who lived in the time of the beast, who belonged to Christ, who made it, who maintained their faith, who had gotten the victory over the image, over the mark, over the number of his name, right? Where were they? They were standing on a sea of glass, having, having the harps of God. They made it. If they're standing on a sea of glass, they are not on the earth. They're not on the earth. Right? They're not. Remember what we read before. Blessed are those who die in the name of the Lord from this day forward. Remember that? So during the time of the beast, it's going to be a ruckus on the earth. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. Because if you maintain your faith with Christ, you will get the victory. You will get the victory. Over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, you will get the victory if you stay with Christ. That's why it's so important right now that we get a workout, that we talk soberly. I mean soberly. Not thinking up theories to side skirt what the, what's written here, but get ready for it. You live in a different time, and there's one thing all of you have a consensus on. Each and every one of you, you've spoken this almost every single week. All of you have identified something. One of the biggest prophecies in the Word of God you have identified. You may not be aware of it, but you've identified it. You talk about it every single week. You notice it every single week. It's happening right before your eyes, and it has never been like this before. Never. But it's happening right now. And I'll tell you something. It's, it's, it, we have to remain sober. But it's also very exciting. It is. Because it's getting real close to a time where the footwork begins. I mean the footwork. See, there was always a time coming. When you were going to have to be responsible for you, not the other person. Listen to me. Not the other guy. You're doing that now. 
there will come a time when you can't do anything for anybody else. All you will be able to do is maintain yourselves. And that day, should you remain faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will have the victory. Because the Lord made you a promise. Anybody know what that is? See, you may be thinking in your head, that's a, that's a tall order, right? It's a lot. It's a lot. Well, see, here's what you may know. You may have forgotten this. The Lord said, he would finish the work he began in you. You don't finish it. He does by his power, by his authority, by his dominion. He will finish the work he began in you. See how foolish it is for people to say or to forecast upon another. Oh, they'll never complete this. They can't do this. They can't do that. Oh, uh, that's right. They're not going to do it. The Lord will do it in them. You already said he would do it. He made that promise. He will finish the work he began in you. He will do it. Hmm? So stay sober in that fact. Don't forget that. That's why you don't walk around with fear of the unknown. So what about the unknown? It may be unknown to us. It is most certainly not unknown to the Most High. And he knows how he's going to deliver us. He already knows. Don't be deceived by the speech of negative people out there who are giving up left and right. Don't you give up. Stay the course. I encourage you to stay the course as best you can, not in comparison to somebody else. Stay the course as best you can with what you have. Remember the seven letters to the seven angels of the seven churches. One of the letters said, hold fast to what you have. Strengthen those things that remain that are ready to die. He's telling you to stay put. Keep what you have. Keep going forward. Be a steward over what God has already given you. Over the knowledge that you have and start working with the tool set God gave you. Because sometimes you'll not work at all and say, well, I'll work when I have this or when I have that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Take what you have right now. And be that steward God called you to be over what he's given you. The truth that you have. The gospel that you have, the compassion that you have, the strength that you have, the wherewithal that you have. Go forward in the Lord with what you have. And give it your all. Give it your all. Do it with a heart of peace and with love. And honor the Lord with everything about yourselves. You want to turn around? That's it. Let's continue. Let's continue. And they, they, listen, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways. Thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen having their breasts girded with golden girdles. One of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels a, the golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Isn't that awesome? Nobody entered into the temple of God until these... That means nobody's... You know what? You read about that. How no one is in the temple of God. Not in the heavens. Until these seven plagues are issued. Until these seven plagues are fulfilled. So at this point in Revelation 15, right? God's people are standing on that sea of glass. Those who got the victory over the beast. Now those who did not, those who gave into it, right? Those who gave up, those who fainted. Those who fainted, those who fainted. 
right? They're on earth. They're about to endure some things they, they do not want to endure. This is the cruel and, and terrible day. They did not want to come. This is when they are overpowered. This is when the judgments of God are in the earth. Remember what that angel declared about the judgment of God? That's it. It's coming. His judgments. His rightful payment for what they did. Now all the other folks who made it are with him. They're with him. And all of that happened when? When did it happen? The harvest, remember? Remember the harvest? Remember what was said in Revelation 14? Hmm? The angels thrust in their sickle. They gathered the clusters of the vine of the earth. The grapes were fully ripe. Right? And they were cast into the great wine press of the wrath of God. That, by the way, you do realize when you take the vine with all the little everything on it and you put it into the wine press, you cannot undo that. At that point, you cannot undo. See, before you do that, before you put the all the, the grapes in the wine press, you can make adjustments. All right? Something can be in there. You can say, oop, let me take that out. Right? You can do that. You may find one on the ground. Oop, let me put that in there. But once you press it, that's it. That's the final act. There's no coming back from that. There's no coming back. And this wine press just so happens to be the wrath of God. Not his goodness, but the wrath. Right? Now, it's important that we have to go back and see what the Lord was talking about because we're talking about the harvest of the earth. This is that uh, dividing line in Revelation between the happenings of Revelation and the judgment of the living God. The point of no return. There's no redemption after this point. There's nobody repenting after this point. It's too late. They had their opportunity to repent. They did not do it. It's over. It's over. When the beast comes, I'm telling you things will be finalized. When that beast is revealed, it's going to be finalized. In that season, many will choose the beast. People are going to come up with every single excuse they can to follow the beast. Me? I'm not concerned about it. Not, I'm not concerned about it. I am concerned about following Christ. The beast? Not concerned about it. That's the folks who follow the beast. That's going to be their problem, not mine. I already know. I'll give up. But listen, you may have to give up some things to give your final answer. But I'll tell you something. When you say yes to Christ and you mean it with all your heart, it doesn't matter how many beasts are on the earth. You're not going to follow the beast. Now, the Lord has given us these little micro uh, uh, conditions right now. You may not know this. But if people are going to live in the time of the beast, they have to be prepared to say no to the beast. How would God ever prepare his children to be strong enough to say no to the beast? To be sober enough to say no to the beast? I'll tell you how. What does the beast offer? Anybody? What does he offer? He offers a continuance of life. He offers the opportunity for you to buy and sell. To live life like you're living now. Which means if you don't follow the beast, you're going to be cut off. Now, some of you are going through this, and you didn't know why. There are things that you've gone through, you've been cut off, and you did not know why. Now, some of you were saying, well, I've been cut off, but I can't go back to it. Because to go back to it, I have to do this sinful thing. And I don't want to do that sinful thing. See, so you didn't know why. And it's a heavy decision. Right? But you know, and I know, in order to get what you had back, you're going to have to compromise. 
right? And as soon as you say, I can uh, spoiler, as soon as you say, nope, I'm not going to compromise, then your father works something out very different than what you had. You indeed will not go back, but you will be restored. This will, th That demonstrates your answer, right? That brings you into this mindset where you actually begin to realize, uh-oh, I may have some weaknesses for the beast. I may not be able to say no. And so you are given an opportunity to really think about that, right? To settle your hearts and your minds before it ever comes. Because a lot of people say, I'm not going to take the mark of the beast. It's not going to be that easy. See, there are people, we talked about this last week. There are people right now, right now, who have sinned and compromised and did everything else to keep their comfort. In fact, that spiritual mark they already bear. They already have it. Because they're ready to give up anything. Right? It'd be like if, if somebody, if you were in a group of people and that group of people was, say they were a provider to you. Somebody in that group provided to you, and they agreed with a certain specific philosophy. Would you agree to not, you know, ruffle anybody's feathers so that you can continue to receive of those people? Or would you say, no, nope, I'm going to take the Lord's way, not Cain's way, and I do not agree with the condemnation that's coming out of your mouth towards anybody? See, to do that, you'll put your comfort in jeopardy, right? So something is very clear. The Lord is saying, it's almost like the Lord is saying, will you continue to choose people as your comfort, or will you choose me as your comfort? Hmm? Think about it. Think about it. You ever see people get in trouble, and they say, well, you know, I know you want to pray and everything, but this is real. You ever hear somebody say that? This is a real problem. I don't have time for that. You see, what that does is it reveals to that person prayer is of no effect. It's of no effect to them. To a person who relies upon the Most High, the first thing they'll do is pray because they need guidance. But to the person who relies upon the world, who trusts in the world, they're not going to pray. They're not doing it. It's going to be last on their list. And many people are thrust into that predicament. To choose between the Lord's way and the known way of the world. See, when the mark comes, it's going to be worse. Can you imagine you being in your house? You refuse to take the mark of the beast. Your citizenship is pulled. You become like an illegal immigrant. Can you imagine that? Having your citizenship revoked? No license. No bank cards. No nothing. And they want you out of whatever place you're in. Now who in the world could stand that? Who would say yes to Christ and endure all of what comes with that? When everybody else on the street is throwing barbecues, you said no to the beast. And they cut your utilities off. And everybody knows who you are. And they start spitting in your direction. All sorts of things will happen. Because you have the old ways. You're believing in the old stuff. And they want you away from their new utopia. How many people could endure that? I'll tell you something. The Lord is allowing us He's allowing us to see what that's like. If you pay attention to your own life. See, if you're on easy street, right? The only people I know of that are on easy street are those who do not belong to the Most High. Everybody else is having to make some tough decisions. Hmm? Everybody else. Lord have mercy. See, with the Lord, you have to, you have to make sure things are clarified, right? Now, the Lord did say, when you're about to be drugged before the courts, 
the judges. He said, don't think of what you're going to say beforehand. The Holy Spirit will give you in that hour what to say. Don't mix that up with making up your mind today. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Today, the day you're given. You are to choose today whom you're going to serve. And so what I'm telling you is this. The more you say yes to the Lord today. And if tomorrow comes and you're in it, say yes again, but do it from the heart. Do it honestly. You're going to be built up like a fortress. And when that time comes of the beast, you will have been built up enough to, to be kept. No matter what happens. No matter what happens, you will be able to stand no matter what happens. But you've got to start today. You cannot start this tomorrow. Nope. Because, listen, if you say in your mind, I'm going to do this so-and-so tomorrow, guess what? Four years ago, you probably said the same thing, and you still did not. You did not start it, did you? Because you're always going to end up saying, I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I know people right now, it's been at least 20 years, and they're still saying, I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. Today, make that decision today. See, because who's going to be unfortunate when this time? There are a lot of people who don't believe the beast is coming. And when the beast comes, if you've been spoiled, it's not going to be easy for you. It's not. It's just not going to be easy for you. Those who have hardships now are going to be built up in strength. They're getting used to something nobody else is getting used to because they are to be kept. Those who are being babied and pampered, they're going to be weak, just like the Lord said they would be weak. The Lord said that because they rejected it. They rejected his correction. They rejected his methods. They rejected his trials. They rejected those things. As soon as trouble came, they said, Lord, get me out of it. I don't want to see it or anything else. They did not realize that trouble just does not come to a saint. No, no. That's your father speaking to you. Every problem you go through, the Lord is asking you, is this enough to get you to turn away from the family? Is this enough to get you to fall like Lucifer fell? And if we give in to that problem, we're saying, yes, it is. This problem can make me fall. And you know, that's a big problem. Because listen to me. If you can com be compromised right now by anything, by anything, by pressure, by anything, by your family, by drugs, by anything, listen to me carefully. If something can get you to walk outside the path of God. Then at any moment, all Satan has to do is recreate those conditions, and he's got you. He's got you. He's got you. See, a lot of people want the problem to go away. You're to overcome everything. You are to face and overcome everything. You are never to run. Stop running. Because it weakens you. The Lord chewed people out in times past. Because they taught his people to run away. Not to face things. Hmm? They are to face things. You start running away. Fear can tell you that that situation was anything and you'll believe it. You'll believe it so much that you'll be fearful. Fearful, it'll come back again. If you face it, you can see it. You may be scared. But the Lord said, what? What would the Lord say? He already told you he would do something. He would show you his salvation. In your weakness, his strength is made perfect. See how that works? That's when the Spirit rises up in you. And if you've not felt that before, what that means is where you would have no power in a certain situation when the Spirit rises up, you'll have strength you never thought you had. is coming. People have been pursuing the worldly life. Just telling you that now. And the Lord has been telling us from the beginning of the Bible until this very time, get ready, I'm coming back. And I will not come back for some corrupted thing. No. I'm coming back. And he gave us a lifetime to get ready. 
People are trying to live forever. They're trying to make this their paradise. And many can't see it. Somebody asked me, why don't you take a vacation? Because my, I don't need a vacation. My joy is in fulfilling things that the Lord gives. My joy is not in a vacation. I don't need a vacation. I don't. I need to accomplish what the Lord has given me. I need to help people because people are in trouble. I want to rest. I don't want to do any of those things because somebody is starving to death. Because somebody does not have somebody giving them the word of God because somebody is lost. Somebody's fearful. Somebody's unprotected. Somebody's forgotten. And it's important to me that those people be found. How do I know that? Because I was one of those people. I was one. And if not for the Lord directly gathering me up, there'd be no me. So there's no way I'm going to turn away from somebody else. There's no way. It's not going to happen. Hmm? And I love my Lord for it. Because of all these trials, I can endure more than I used to endure. I can endure a lot. Only because of the trials and tribulations and troubles and all these obstacles and everything else. Hmm. Your time of deliverance is coming. Prepare yourselves for it. Your Lord is coming back. Prepare yourselves for it. Prepare yourselves. Let's continue. I'm going to read something to you guys. I'm going to read something. We're going to unlock a can of worms tonight. Yes, we are. But we're talking about the harvest. Right? We're talking about the harvest. Now, before we talk about the harvest harvest, what sign is given for the harvest? It was echoed in Revelation 14. It was echoed here. He kept saying the earth is ripe. Put the sickle in. The earth is ripe. Right? Put it in. The earth is ripe. How is the earth ripe? Let me go ahead and tell you. Iniquity and wickedness was at its top level. And there it is. The number one sign of all signs. Listen to this carefully. Listen. Iniquity and wickedness is the greatest sign you'll ever have. Ready for this? When the wicked spring as grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. That's the judgment of God. That is Psalms 92.7. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. That's revealing. What about this one? Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get ye down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for the wickedness is great. The command is given when iniquity and wickedness is at their height. And what do you see in the world? What do you see in the world? Now, it's very difficult for new generation people to see it. But what do you see? You see iniquity, abominations. You see people who have totally perverted the way of the Lord. You see people who have no problem rewording what thus saith the Lord. That's what you see. People are just changing the Bible. They have, they're, they have no conscience. They don't care. They'll do what they do so they can get what they can get. They don't care. Wickedness is great. And it is one of the greatest signs we'll ever see. And you're seeing those signs. When a country, when a country authorizes wickedness, you know we're in trouble. It does not matter what a person thinks. It matters what the Lord said. When a nation authorizes wickedness, game over. Game over. And the nations of this earth have been authorizing iniquitous things, but now it's totally wicked. Absolutely 100% wicked and that wickedness is spreading it's in the minds of the youth it's in the ways 
of those who have just started in the world working, right? And they love it that way. You better believe it's coming. Now, I have to read to you guys something. So you understand, because you're looking all around, the number one issue that we have is what? What's the main issue that we have on the earth right now that's natural? It's just destroying everything. Weather, right? Now, you guys can say all you want. You can go ahead and say it's harp. You go ahead and say it's all types of military and government programs. Let me read to you something. A passage. You ready? You guys ready? Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking you a king. Uh-oh, let me read the whole thing. That was Isaiah, I mean First Samuel twelve seventeen. Let me read the whole thing. Now therefore behold, the king whom ye have chosen, and whom ye have desired, and behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. If ye will fear the Lord, and serve him, and obey his voice, and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both you, and also the king that reigneth over you, continue following the Lord your God. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you, as it is with your fathers. Let me point something out. Because we have a standard. God said, you know, God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Let me read this to you again. And First Samuel twelve fourteen. If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both you and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. See, that God is giving us freedom. He's not forcing a king to be anything. He appoints, but it's still up to that king to become who he may become. Now, if the king and the people honor the Lord, they will continue to serve the Lord. But if they rebel, oh my goodness gracious. If they rebel, here's what happens. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, right? If you won't obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you, as it was against your fathers. And now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. You see what the end result was? The people feared the Lord and Samuel. The people feared. They didn't have harp. No. The people feared the Lord. Do you not know that there indeed is a pattern to these storms and it correlates to decisions of the places under duress by these storms? I'm telling you, if you look, just look deep, consistent, look at everything. Look deep, consistently, excusing nothing. And you tell me there's no correlation. Because you'll see it every single time. That's why I don't instantly give credit to heart. That's almost like a person saying God is not doing it. God is not working anything. Are you kidding me? The fact is, people don't know if it's harp or not. They immediately attribute these weather phenomena to mankind. That within itself can... That's a very bold move. Foolish, too. The Lord does what he does for a high purpose. Not for a low purpose. But God warned us when people have no knowledge, they start coming up with things. They invent with these, they invent things with these evil thoughts, taking his doings and will attribute them to other things. They'll do it every single time. 
This is the first of many cases where God uses his creation to handle things. He already told us about the weather in the end times, in these days. And it's doing exactly what he said it would do. And do you not know what the experts say? Even the military experts are troubled by this. Do you not know they have to move an entire base? Why would the military fire up its own weapon and destroy itself? That would be the dumbest thing they could ever do. It is damaging critical infrastructure. I hope you realize that. It is not working in their favor. But I'll tell you something in each and every case. You're going to notice rebellion. And when it consumes hundreds of thousands of lives, boy, the people are going to get really cranky because they have seen no weather phenomena yet compared to what they will see. And then after all that rain, humidity levels are going to go right to about 10 to 12 percent. And everything is going to dry up and no rain is going to fall anywhere. What are they going to say then? When we endure three or four hypercanes this year, you watch people say, oh, that's definitely harp. No, it isn't. No, it is not. I tried to share what a compression event was. I did. I did. They have said that at least 14 times with meteorologists. It's a science they don't completely understand. They did not count on. They even said something is compressing the upper atmospheres. Oh, I know. Anyway, so our father is viewing all of this. All of it. Hmm? All of it. Lord have mercy. Do you guys see that? The Lord used that to cause the people to pay attention. Somebody says, Mike, what is all the different shapes in the clouds? People have been seeing different cloud formations, black rainbows. What are they? They're, they're, they're going to see a multitude of things in the clouds. I mean, let me tell you something to watch for. I wouldn't worry about the shapes of the clouds until you see a cloud break away and go in the opposite direction of the airflow, come lower in altitude and start going through neighborhoods. Stay away from those, please. Do not become curious. Stay away. Don't be afraid. Just stay away. Stay away. People will begin to see clouds break away. Doesn't matter if it's night or day. It does not matter if it's sunny or stormy. They will see clouds break away. Stay away. Stay away from it. Try not to look into that. Do not touch it. Don't go around it. Just stay away. You can come up to your front door and then go somewhere else to stay away from it. It go around your car. Leave it be. Just so stay away from it. Stay away. Please stay away from it. Let it do what it does. But stay away from it. Now I know it sounds strange. And it will st sound strange. Until you guys start to undergo it. Until it becomes common. Stay away from it. The other things that people are seeing. You have to understand light phenomena in the heavens. Light can be tricky. There are certain things that are just natural light phenomena. But there are certain things that are indeed something else. They are indeed something else. And the best rule of thumb is this. Right? When you become curious about things to the point where you get excited... That's the very reason God does not show angels too much. Because people would begin to worship them. It can throw off the course of your day. Be about your father's business. Be about your father's business. Right? Don't let something that is uh, amazing looking throw you off. Or have you investigate where you have forsaken everything else. Believe me or not. But the days are coming. When you will grow tired and troubled by seeing too much. And another day will come when you will desire that the Lord withdraw all knowledge in you of seeing anything.
Man will desire to return back to the days of innocence where they are right now. Because when these things begin to manifest and you see these things, you can forget innocence. It's going to trouble people day and night. Many will have heart attacks because the manifestations will be so dense. Too many manifestations. Too many things happening. And when you see the one thing and think you're free from that, something else will manifest. This is, the, this is what the world is turning into. And it's already happening. It's happening already. Please don't be curious, George. Please. In the eternal realm, you'll know about it all. You will. And some people are unfortunate enough to know certain things about those uh, manifestations. It is not something one should desire. All too often, man desires to know what the Lord did not disclose. And I'll tell you something. When mankind learns something the Father did not disclose, it can become one of the greatest burdens anybody would ever have in their lives. When you're ready to know something, your Father will not withhold it from you. But seeing the wrong thing at the wrong time can disturb your entire life. It can set you back years, and you don't have years. These are delicate days. Very delicate days. Somebody said, did you see the news about the hundreds of thousands of people giving their lives to Gaza? Well, we kind of have firsthand we kind of have first-hand uh, info from Gaza. So let me tell you what I've observed. There's a hatred of Israel. But it's about 200 times stronger than it was prior to these attacks and prior to this ground war. The children are sickened by Jews. There are chants about the Jews in the streets. And they have obviously not read parts of the Bible to really see who's responsible for this. They attribute these heinous acts to an entire people. I don't care what the deed is, that it's wrong. And it's absolutely 100% wrong. Nobody gets a free pass. Death is death and war is very unfortunate. But make no mistake, those children that are over there have vowed to kill any Jew they see. They want to fight when they get older. As soon as they can hold an AK-47 or similar weapon, they want to fight. They want revenge. Don't make that mistake. They want revenge, which is why that entire region is going to go up in smoke. You know how I know that? Because Edom will go up with it. God has already made that declaration. It's not about a people. No, this is about something driving people. God will call all men unto himself. Those who answer, answer. Those who don't, they won't answer because of hatred. A clear line is being drawn. And I'm going to tell you guys something. I'll take a break. But listen, the happenings in your life, these things that happen in your life, they happen in your life for a reason. Satan will always attempt to have you utilize any unfortunate thing in your life so that you can hate something. Satan will always give you a target. Your Father in Heaven never does that. Satan is the one that will give you a thousand reasons to hate something. God is the one who will give you ten billion reasons to forgive everything. Satan's under pressure. His day of condemnation is coming. And he knows it. He's in a rush. So he's teaching hatred to as many as he can with everything that takes place. Your Father in Heaven does not teach hatred. What's happening in Gaza is very unfortunate. But, but, but don't think stuff like this just happens. Please don't operate by that type of 
view on things. Like for some reason, everybody over there was innocent. Right? And now all of a sudden, you know, the innocent people are dying. Many do not know the acts of the folks who occupy in those places on both sides. There are people in Jerusalem that should not be in Jerusalem. There are people in Israel that should not be in Israel. There are people in Gaza that should not be in Gaza. There are people that do things. You have no idea what they do because if you knew, then you'd really be confused. As to why someone would give someone like that a free pass. You think Saddam Hussein was bad? Throwing people in meat grinders while they were alive? Huh? Families essentially being ripped to shreds. Their babies, pregnant women, the whole family. Who puts a whole family in a meat grinder? Saddam Hussein did. Anybody who opposed him, that's what happened. a good rule of thumb if you don't know firsthand the situation be careful of anybody's interpretation of a situation if you start believing because a person convinced you that something is true and your father did not reveal to you the truth of the matter just think about that you could believe just about anything and a sign a sign your anger your dislike, your judgment and condemnation to a very innocent person. The father does not side with anybody who does that. So it's a good practice when somebody, when, you, when, when it's a situation that you have no first-hand knowledge of, let the Lord handle that, right? Let the Lord handle that. Because the truth is, we don't know. It's kind of like the Ukraine and Russia. People don't know firsthand who these people are. They don't. They just don't. The soldiers have been to the Ukraine uh, many of you know many times. I've been there a few times. And I'll tell you something: the gospel's needed everywhere. Don't fall for the okie doke for the rhetoric that you hear on the news. And the regurgitation of the, the news stories, people regurgitate news stories, adding bits and pieces to get hits on the Internet. Please don't fall for that. You will know the truth soon. Everything in the darkness is going to be bought into the light. But it seems that the media is primarily concerned with propaganda to have the people believe a specific narrative and they do that for political gains and purposes please don't fall for that no matter how convincing they sound if you don't have first-hand knowledge the truth is you don't know that phrase the blind leading the blind into a ditch right both fall into a ditch is exactly that if we follow mankind right if that person falls and we've been following them, we're going to fall too. That's precisely why you don't follow mankind. You can compliment your brother, but follow Christ. He'll never fall into a ditch. If your brother falls and you've been following Christ, you can reach out your hand and pick him up from falling, right? But if you're following him, you're going to fall right behind him. Like in some of these churches, you guys will witness this. If the pastor of a church falls and the people have been following the pastor, then the congregation is going to fall. But what would happen if the congregation was not following the pastor, but they complimented the truth the pastor spoke? That means if that pastor falls, the congregation can say, oh, no, let's give him a hand. See, they won't fall with him but they can assist him in getting back up again. See how that works? But if you follow man, if you trust man so much that you would take his word from a... But in truth, you don't know these newscasters, so in, essentially you're taking a stranger's word because of their professionalism, because of what they're convincing you that they are, you're taking the word for it and believing it wholeheartedly. That we would then take that word and go give it to somebody else as though it's truth. We have to really be careful of that. 
Nobody should do that with them, especially you guys. Your children are the most high called by a higher standard. You can't do that of newscasters, nor can you do that of me. You've got to look in the word of God. If I align with the word of God, good. Very good. But you can't blindly repeat what I say as though it's absolute truth. I too am but flesh, full of errors, prone to things. So don't do that. That would dishonor me anyway. Compliment me by knowing the truth the Lord has given you from his word. So that if one day I start slipping up, falling all over the place, you can say, Mike, come back home. That's how you keep a house strong. That's how it remains strong. If the dad of a house drinks, should everybody in the house start drinking? Right? No. If the dad of the house overdoes it and everybody else is sober, they can say, hey, he overdid it. Let's put him to bed. We'll chew him out tomorrow. So he's still dad of the house, right? And he didn't fall so much to where he died. And the house can remain strong. Why? Because the other members did not follow him in his drinking fit to the point of drunkenness. Hmm? God is so good. He is good. If we would only apply what the Lord has given us. I believe, listen, folks, I believe that when things like this start coming forward, it is pretty bold. People hate for anybody, especially if, when I come forward with things like this, believe me, I'm hated big time. Every time I say don't follow another person, oh, I'm hated. I believe me, I'm rebuked and hated and everything else. But it's incredibly important that all of us follow Christ and all of us have an understanding that if we do not have hands-on knowledge, first-hand knowledge, then essentially we are believing the words of someone we don't even know. That's putting faith in flesh. The very thing Jesus said don't do. Okay, folks, I'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT. Hopefully we have more than 10 people listening when I get back. Hopefully. <laughs> I'll be back in a few minutes. Let me finish um, following the storms in First Samuel. Let me finish something for you guys. Let me finish something. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil, to ask us a king. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good in the right way. Only fear the Lord, and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both you and your king. Did you guys hear that? I did, man. did you guys hear that? Does anybody see any implications in that? Do you see the weight of that? Hmm? Hmm? 
Do you see? You see why praying for your leaders is so important. See, the Lord said he changes. Not it's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Those people, right? Listen, they wanted a king. Just like people do today. The same thing that happened back then is happening right now before your eyes. The exact same thing. And the exact same consequences are right around the corner. Because people have become hardened and foolish. Just like these people, God has done great things for us. Americans. God has done great things for us. And look what people are doing. They're not asking for the Lord. They're asking for a king. They're not asking for righteousness. They're asking that they get their way. Back then, because Samuel was not going to stop praying for them. He knew what was at stake. Storms came, bad storms, scared the people to pieces. And after the storms, they said, oh, oh tell God just to, you know, with, uh, please don't kill us this way. Please don't kill us this way. Right? And what he said, he said, I'm going to continue to teach you to do right and pray for you. But just love the Lord with all your heart. Stay within your bounds with this, within his righteousness. Love him with all your heart. Honor him. Realize what he did for you. Realize what you did that was in wickedness. God has selected you. You didn't select him. God picked you up. You didn't pick him up. And he said, if you don't, but if you continue to rebel, if you continue... On this same course you're on, you will be consumed, you and your king. So it's almost like they rebelled. They were asked, they got really got in the ways of themselves. They were asking for a king. They had forgotten about the Lord. They were doing wicked things. And a storm came. The weather. The weather scared some folks. It took some, right? It was very threatening. Storms are threatening. We've had them too. And it seems like when, when Katrina hit, people went back to church. They did. For a little bit. And they went right back to wickedness. Then more storms came. They go right back to wickedness. And then you notice something funny. It seems like all the hurricanes are coming to the U.S. Why? Because it's the U.S., it's the USA that has held a standard. You, those of you who believe in Christ, have held a standard in righteousness when the whole world fell away. When the world fell away, when their faith was minimal, missionaries were going out all over the place from the USA. In government, they were thanking God. In the schools they were praying. All of a sudden, they turned away from all that. They said, hey, look what we have built unto ourselves. We did this. You hear that out of every president's mouth. Look what I did. They're not giving God glory. The people are doing it. That's why their leaders do it. Because of the people. You can't blame the leader because the leaders will compliment the people. And if the people are sitting there saying, look what we have done, then of course the leader is going to respond that way. That's exactly what we did. Then all of a sudden, fights started to take the Ten Commandments down to get Jesus out of government buildings. They'll have a black stone at the UN, but they not the Bible. Then they got into the issue about the Bible in court. As though they wanted no witness of the word of God in a court system. 
when they threw it out of the schools. Then people started dying because they wanted the Bible, their kids to know the Bible. They were scoffed. People had to move out of town. People were attacked from that. In certain schools, they would say a morning prayer. Parents would get upset and sue the school. Many turned against the living God and his word. Until we get to today. People are not saying we need Christ Jesus. That's not what they're saying. They're saying we need a, this guy or we need that guy. That's all they're concerned about. And it just so happens that the USA is undergoing a phenomena with these storms. We get the hurricanes. We do in the USA. We get the hurricanes. We get all the tornadoes. We do. And even after all that, now you have Christians with every storm coming. They say it's harp. The government's doing it. They say it like they turn the system on themselves, like they witness the aircraft taking off with the technology, interacting with the weather. I've heard people say, well, God won't do anything like that with the weather. The weather's automatic. We just read the opposite, didn't we? God will utilize his creation any way he wants to. It's his creation. It's so similar to today. God adopted the USA, fed the USA, spiritually fed the USA, began to alter other nations through the USA. And the USA was lifted up in its own heart, thinking it was only them not giving God any credit. The same thing the Assyrian did. The same thing King Nebuchadnezzar did. The exact same thing. God utilized the Assyrian. God utilized King Nebuchadnezzar for the sake of his people. And the Bible teaches us they were lifted up in their hearts. And what did the, what did the Lord say to the Assyrian? Can the axe, right? Can the axe boast against the one that made it? In other words, can a hammer boast to the carpenter no because a hammer does nothing unless it is used it is the skill of the carpenter that's the only reason the hammer does a good job so can a hammer brag on itself no it cannot can the USA brag on itself no because by the power of the most high things have been done things were demonstrated to the world because the message we had to give out to the world included the living God. Back in the old days, Jimmy Carter with Iran, they were praying. They were. Back in the old days, even with Reagan, they were praying. They were. And they had no problem getting on air saying, thank God for that. It was the Lord who did this, that, and the other. They hated Reagan for that. They hated Carter for that. They hated the people about, now not all of them were that way, but they were saying it. They were saying it was God's grace. They were praying in the White House, whether people know that or not. They were doing that. And, but, but you don't hear that these days. You don't want to know what I think about what's happening in these uh, uh, common days. You don't want to know. But I can tell you this. The people who believe in the Most High, the people are dictating the narrative. Don't look at the leaders saying it's their fault. We should all know by now. Not any These leaders cannot do what they want to do. They cannot. They do what they do by demand of the people. Remember when Donald Trump wanted to build that wall? Why did he not build the wall? Somebody give me an answer. What happened? What happened? He couldn't build the wall. And you, you know, and I know, he wanted to build a wall. What stopped him? Cold in his tracks. What stopped him? What stopped him from building that wall? Come on, let's get this. What stopped him? Thank you, Congress. That's right. Congress did. 
Congress. So a president cannot do what they want to do. They can't do that. And Congress was working against. You know what? In fact, didn't everybody talk about Donald Trump like he was a, a moron when he first came into office? Yes, they did. They made fun of him. They made jokes about him and everything else. Then all of a sudden, everybody turned around. Do you know why? Because the people, they weren't making fun of him. The people were demanding him. And when they found out that the people liked him, Congress changed, didn't they? Huh? Congress changed. Because of what? Because of you. Because people began to write in saying, what are you doing making fun of our president? What are you doing? You, you want to lose your seat? And they changed their tune. So what does that make them? They're almost like harlots. I hate to put it that way, but they are. They have forgotten that they serve the people. But in this case, the people have forgotten that their children are the most high. May God graced us with this country. That people died so that we can live in this country and have our homes with the holes in the roof. That people were over here starving in the winters. You know what it's like in the winter when you're camping and there's no store to go to? Nothing was over here. People were eating each other to stay alive or they would starve to death. So I'm telling you, they shed their blood to establish this country. You cannot tell me man did that by himself. The most I had to be involved or would not have happened. Then we get to a time like this. He settled everything so that you could be put here. He didn't put you in a time when they were here in this country and bears were attacking everybody and they didn't have heat houses or anything else for the winter. He didn't put you here during that time. He put you here now. He didn't put us here so that we could sit back and relax in our lounge chairs and agree with the world. No, he put us here to make a difference because we're right at the end of the matter. And people have forgotten about the Most High. If you go back and read Second Samuel chapter 12, you're going to find out once a, that when the prophet gave that warning, he prayed. He prayed. The Lord always does that. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. Forget about a prophet saying anything. Let me tell you what happens. The Lord will have his way made known. In the land. And when the people know it, the Lord will then demonstrate. If the people continue to rebel, it's going to fall apart. It's going to be over. As people who are called by the Most High, are we taking everything the Lord did through humanity for granted? I pray we don't. All the sacrifices made, all the sufferings of your forefathers, is it all in vain, all for nothing? Would we just cancel the dignity of somebody else's life by us not obeying the voice of the Lord? Are we going to agree with the new iniquity and wickedness that stepped into this nation that defies the living God and agree with that? Or will we uphold what the Lord has surely put within all of us? All of us are called. All of us love the Lord. All of us have a desire for servitude. That's why sometimes you fight amongst each other because you have different ideas of servitude. The point is, you desire the Lord's will be done. We're not perfect. No. But what in the world are we going to do? Because I'll tell you, I, I, this part I know. If you think this is going to be a repeat of any year before it, you're wrong. You're miserably mistaken. There's a strong calling right now. There is a strong spirit of both warning and truth right now. And if God's people do not move, well, we just signed our own suffering warrant. Then we deserve what comes next. 
all those people who gave their lives and were unwilling to give and give anything were frightened to give anything were frightened to stand within the integrity of which we are called we're scared to death that somebody may look at us or not like us when those who came before us faced everything and they established what they established for their children. See, they were over here suffering. And they knew it in their minds. They wouldn't make it. Many knew they wouldn't make it. And they said, I'm doing this for my children. They kept diaries. It's in the diaries. Go back in history and read it. They did what they did for you and for me. But here we come. And we just what? Throw it all away? Dishonor the whole act? Act as though the Lord didn't do a great move? Do you know how much of a great move that is to get people to, to, to go into a death situation and begin to prepare things for their children knowing that they will die? Nothing was settled here. There was no escape. From the wild animals. From the bitter cold. From starvation. Disease. There was no, no relief from that. They went headlong into it because they wanted to establish a land of freedom for you. Now what in the world are we going to do with that? Please think about that. Because something is trying desperately to get us to be complacent. And how in the world can we be complacent? When everything this nation was truly built upon has been pushed away. This is a season of labor, of true labors. I don't believe it's in us to throw away the commitment that so many made before us. I don't believe it's in us to dishonor the God-given idea. However, given to those people who established what they established over here. There's no way people could do that by themselves. We know it was divinely inspired. All good things are. We have a work to do. And God entrusted us and called us to do that work that we're looking for somebody else to do. Somebody else is not going to do it. That's why I sing you so strongly. Every day of your life, you wrestle with it. But now you know why. It's not somebody else's job. It's not their task. It's not their calling. It's our calling. All right. Let's continue. The harvest, the wickedness is great, right? So there are scriptures that declare when wickedness is great, the harvest is coming, right? The harvest is coming. And God is so faithful. He is so faithful. Listen to this. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Jeremiah 36, 3. That is so beautiful. Listen to me. You know what that means? Listen to what I just, listen to what I just read. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them. Then he gives us a reason. 
that they may return every man from his evil way. So in other words, God being a just God will give us the conditions of our full consummation, us being consumed, the finish of our walk in a bad way if necessary. He's going to tell us the truth, that we will perish. But for what reason would he tell us all these things? That we may return each and every one of us, from our evil way. In other words, when you're walking in that way of evil, you identify the warnings, right? You see the warnings. You get frightened. You don't want any part of those warnings. The Lord allows us to see these warnings, to see the manifestations of a great many things. He's encouraging us to get rid of the evil. He's showing us the consequences of following that evil path. And you will never escape it. You'll never escape seeing the consequences of it. In the hopes that we'll turn from it. I'm bringing this up because revelation, revelation is about a bunch of, is, you see destruction there, don't you? You see it. You see warnings. You see a great horror sent to humanity an inescapable judgment is what you see why would the Lord show us this early why would he show us this early why would he allow us to see this early why give us prophecy in the first place because I'll tell you something every time we start thinking about prophecy and when it truly hits us in the heart that's when we sober up and we say, you know, Lord, I want no part of that destruction thing. Because you'd be surprised. Evil. Something that's truly evil. Right? They already know they're going to be destroyed. And they choose to be evil anyway. But the righteous, in truth, they want no part of destruction. It's not part of them. And so they see the consequences and they'll ultimately say, I don't want those consequences. That's not me. I don't want that. Here I am walking in the earth desiring peace. I don't want the consequences. I would, I would like peace. Then we come to our senses. Lord, forgive me. Don't we? Then we start recognizing the path we took. And we say, ah, no, you won't trick me again. Because once you're called back and you realize the path you were on, right? You're called back from that path. You know that you were duped. You know you fell for something. And when you acknowledge that, yes, you fell for something because you were, you were kind of duped into running after other things, that's when you become a help to somebody else who's on that same path. And you can say, hey, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, I know where you're going. If you allow me, I can assist you. And you can help them in ways that nobody ever helped you with. And then when they're free, both you two can go help somebody else. Before you know it, a victory is had. Because everybody is reclaimed. That was going down that way. Listen, it has to begin somewhere. Somebody has to go through it first. You guys know I say this a lot. Somebody has to go through it first. Somebody had to go down that path and nobody came for you. Somebody just left you right in the middle of danger. Somebody left you in that abusive situation. Somebody left you with that father that beat your brains out, threatened you all the time. Somebody left you with parents who didn't care about you, left you in the system to be adopted. And even those who adopted you kept passing you around. Somebody had to go first. Somebody had to establish the beginning of this process because the Lord's working through you. He does not need us. He can do everything by himself. But he sent you here to this earth. You are his body. He works through you to other people. That's why you burn so strongly with things you hardly understand. I can almost guarantee that the majority of you sat back and said, I don't even know why. Why? I want to do this. I have no idea how to do this. You've had guilt when nobody else had guilt. You had conviction when nobody else had conviction. You found it odd and strange. You didn't know how people could survive doing the things they were doing. It's because you're called. 
You're called. You're of a different spirit. That's why. And somebody had to go first. And somebody's going to have to go first now. In the reaching out part. See, obviously, something has gone wrong. Something has gotten to those who believe. Something has gotten to the ecclesia, just like Jesus said. So the alarm clocks have to go off. You know what those are? World events. Things like weather. Things like war. Things like volcanism. Things like earthquakes. And when they start going off, they look unfair. That's the alarm clock. It'll wake us up. Now at that point, if we consider, and we are shocked into remembering, we'll turn away from iniquity and all this other stuff back unto the Lord our God. We get back on that path. Everything you ever needed is on that path in the will of God for you and your life. See, you have a path. Just as you were sent to this earth, there is a path that only you can follow. It's for you. And nobody can go on that path and steal anything on that path. Everything you ever needed is on that path. It is not on a stranger's path. It's on the path your father has set for you. And it's time for you to find it. How do you find it? You answer the call. You seek to be obedient. You find that path in obedience. You know those feelings that come over you? When people start talking about politics, right? Stop pressing it down. Stop suppressing it. Uh Uh-uh. Let it show itself. Time for you to find out where that's coming from. Why do I not like this? And what is this in me that does not like that? You start to face and address it. To be purged of anything that would... See... In truth, nothing is supposed to move you except the Most High. You're not to be moved by politics, by somebody's good or bad nature. You're not to be moved by any of that. You're to be moved by the Most High only. Nothing is to have power over you, but it does. Because if you can be moved by those things, your life can be steered always. All somebody has to do is put that in your way, and you will steer clear of it time for you to face it time for you to find why does why do those things have a trigger in my life nothing should have power over you nothing should be able to make you not think about the most high so it's time to identify those things that have power over you and see them for what they are Because they compete with the Lord your God. They compete with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they will keep you off the path God has given just for you. You ever get a bunch of Christians together? Nobody discusses politics. You know why? Because they know when you start discussing politics, fights begin. Are you kidding me? You mean to tell me you can get a lot of people who believe in Jesus Christ, and through a topic discussion, they can start fighting? What evil is so strong as to take like-minded believers and turn them against each other from something worldly? Um, No. Time for us to end that authority over our lives. That's an evil authority. Nothing should be able to make you target your brother and sister in Christ. Nothing should have that power. And we all know what the Lord said. Nothing indeed has power over you except those things you give power to. So in some way, form, or fashion, you've given power to that topic to overpower you. And it's time for you, it's time for you to take up your position. Giving nothing power over you. But let me warn you, as soon as you think about this, Satan is not going to want to lose his territory. You're going to begin to identify not only the the, the components of politics that cause you to act like everybody else and turn against your brother or sister in Christ, but there are other things also. In the end, 
In the end, the entire point is that nothing will ever have power over you again. Nothing. You know what happens when nothing has power over you? You're no longer afraid. You don't operate in fear. And when you don't operate in fear, you can both hear and see clearly. Fear will put a filter over your ears and your eyes and even your mouth so that what you hear is different from what's happening. What you see is altered from the true picture before you. And what you speak, what you speak is different than what you desire to communicate. When that's taken away, you're back. And Satan knows it. See, you're a big threat to Satan, or he would not target you in any way. See, we have to sort through all that, don't we? Hmm? That's why I like the Psalm 119, 133. Order my steps in the word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. That's Psalm 119. And 133. Let not any iniquity have dominion over me. And what does that tell you? That iniquity can have dominion over you. Do you see that? Iniquity can have power over your life. Here we have a prayer that says, Order my steps, Lord, and let not iniquity have dominion over me. So there you are, it's possible. And it's likely, it's more than possible, it is likely. That prayer should let you know that a long time ago they dealt with similar things. It's time to get free of that. For real, get, get free of it, for real. Don't suppress it. Don't push it down so that it surfaces later. Uh -uh. Once you purge it, it cannot surface because it's no longer in you. It's not part of you again. So long as you suppress it, it is in fact a chain, a burdensome chain. None of us need that chain. I'm not. Okay, folks. God will deliver his people. We know that. Right? We know that. And there's something else. In this time of iniquity and the rise of iniquity, we see in Revelation the harvest is taking place. Now, Jesus spoke about this harvest. He did. He spoke about it by giving us a story of a sower, right? Of a farmer that sowed a field. And an enemy came behind him and sowed seeds behind him. And he said, oh, they said, hey, do you want us to go, right? And take up the, take up the bad seed. And the farmer said, no, 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 no. He said, no, don't do that. Because if you take up the bad ones, right, you could hurt the wheat. Anybody understand that? You remember when he talked about that? Because they said, Lord, should we go and remove the tares now? You know, No, he said, wait till they're full grown. You remember that? Wait till they're full grown, he said. So, you have to wait till the, you can't remove the tares when they're young or when they're an adolescent. You have to remove the tares when they're both grown up together. Anybody know why? He said, the, see, the Lord said, no, he said, because of you, unless you damage the wheat, right? You'll damage the wheat. You can damage the wheat. How can you damage the wheat? Can somebody translate that? If you, that's just like exposing somebody. If somebody is exposed early, you mean it could damage the wheat? 
Uh oh, see, this is something you got to know because we're talking about the level of iniquity in the world rising to an all time high. And that is the greatest sign we could ever have. Right? But then you have to put up with the tears all the while. A lot of people are saying the roots are intertwined. Let me give you a, let me give you a, a, a different translation. You ready? In the real world, you have good people, evil people, and good people growing together. When I see my good, I mean those who are marked by the hand of God that will ultimately come to Christ. They've been called, right? They have to grow with the ones who are twice, twice plucked up by the roots, evil people, right? Evil people. Say we started COT yesterday. And somehow the Lord gave me extended vision, and I can see everybody in COT in a, in a very black or white nature. Meaning, if a person is one of the dark ones, they're tear, and if they're light, they're wheat, and I can see it, right? So I say, okay, we just started, we're just giving an example. Suppose we started yesterday for the first time. And I decide my infinite wisdom to remove all the obstacles before we get started. So all you guys coming to the chat room, you're talking to each other, and all of a sudden people start missing. You know what you'll do? You'll say, well, we're so-and-so. Oh, I miss so-and-so. So-and-so was so nice. Where'd he go? And then somebody else is missing. Well, I can't find so-and-so either. Where'd they go? Oh, they were such a, such a beautiful person. Oh, so beautiful. Where did they go? And people start missing like that. All of a sudden, you guys find out I did it. And he said, well, Mike, why did you remove so-and-so? That person never did anything. Mike, you're just terrible. You're, oh, I can't be. I got to go. Right? So you would actually think, if I could see them and you could not, you would think I was doing something evil. That's what you would think. You cannot uproot evil in the beginning. You know why? Because the wheat does not know that the tear is a tear. And if you pull it up, they're going to have no understanding as to why. They'll say, well, that person was just a nice individual. That person was beautiful. I don't understand what happened to them. Hmm? So the Lord said, no, wait till they're full grown. And when they're full grown, I'll command the harvest. And all the tares are going to be gathered up into bundles and burned. And all the wheat is going to be gathered into my barn. See that? Which means what? It's very difficult to know. You cannot know who is who until what? See, when you're full grown, what determines if wheat is full grown or not? Fruit, fruit, fruit. It must bear fruit. That will let you know it's ready. Correct? That will let you know when it bears fruit. Before it bears fruit, you don't know what it is. And you may assume everything is good. But when it bears fruit, folks, follow me on this. When it bears fruit, the harvest is coming. What you see in the world right now is the fruit. You see the fruit. You're starting to see the fruit. You're starting to notice people out who have been out there for a long time. And you're seeing the trail of fruit, of, of darkness and evil that they have in their lives. Now you can understand. Now they can be removed. Because, see, about 20 years ago, you'd, you'd say, no, that person was good. See, Jesus told us, you'll know a tree by its fruit. He never said, you'll know a tree any other way. He said, you'll know it by its fruit. He taught us that principle. It's taught in the Old Testament. You're not going to know something any other way than by its fruit. You're now in a time when the fruit can be seen because when the fruit can be seen, it's time to harvest. That's when you take the vine and you throw it the great wine press of the wrath of God. The fruit is being seen. And listen, when the fruit is yielded, the tree does not care what you call it. Once the fruit yields, 
once you can see that fruit, once the fruit is there, right? Then even the tree knows. It knows. It knows. And it knows that everybody else knows. So then it's somewhat emboldened. In nature, you say, you see an apple on the tree and say, you're an apple tree. And the apple tree will say, yes, I am. Walk to the next tree. Well, you're not an apple tree. You're something different. I don't know what you are, but that fruit looks nasty. You'll see it sure does. And so what about it? See, once it yields the fruit, then in real life terms, once people, once people, once they produce that fruit and you identify that fruit, the person defends their yielding of that fruit. They don't care what you think they are. They don't care. They're found out to be exactly what they are, and that's what they end up being. See, in the time of the yielding of fruit, that's when people display what they truly are. Before that fruit comes out, though, when they're not bearing fruit, they act like they're many different things. When the fruit comes out, you're going to find out. There have been people who have been in the body of Christ for a long time. But the fruit is yielding of everyone. So some people are going to say, you know what? I never did believe in Christ. I'm trying to tell you something here. They're going to say, I never did believe in Christ. They're going to say, I did what I did because it was something to do, but I never did believe in Christ. Folks, I'm trying to tell you something. You're going to have folks that you judged totally wrong. You thought they were wicked. And you're going to find that they loved the Lord with all of their heart, with all of their soul. They were just presented in a bad light. You're going to see the truth. Those who think will make it, many won't. And those who think won't make it, many will. You're seeing the truth. And it just so happens to be the time when iniquity and wickedness is great in the earth. The time of the harvest. A harvest does not come if nothing is bearing fruit. You live in a time where everything will bear fruit. Everything will bear fruit. You guys got that? Hope you see that. Because these times are going to become, they're, they're going to be fast. They're going to compound each other. They will. An identification of these days. And it's good. It's good because you understand what's within it. And it can refine your walk. God does not work in vain things. He doesn't do it vain things. So everything we're going through is highly purposed. And is in fact for our deliverance. Our perfect deliverance. Hmm? Iniquity, wickedness, one of the greatest signs of the end times. It is, in fact, when the Lord says, put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Get you down for the press is full and the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. The wickedness is great. These, in Matthew... In Matthew, remember the Lord said, the harvest truly is plenteous. That's what he said. You've been living in a time where men labor, right? Where people labor among the plants of the harvest, right? That would have separate this. Because Jesus said, remember he said, uh, um, uh, the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Remember he said that. So what the Lord has done here is this. The harvest, the harvest was indeed plenteous, right? The harvest is not coming because he said, don't let someone say that, the, you know, the harvest is coming. No. He said the harvest is right then and there, right? So the laborers of the harvest help the fruit, help, help that fruit be picked, right? They help that fruit come forth. The laborers. We have entered into other men's labors for helping the wheat to grow, right? Helping it because some have grown and, and, and they did bear fruit, but those have to grow up and then go back and help the little ones out, 
because they're bearing fruit. So you have different, you know, different heights, different heights. But then there was always a time coming where all the layers and all the ages of the wheat would be harvested, where everything would show exactly what it is. And it just so happens we live in that time when the iniquity is great in the earth. That's it. That's precisely when all the tares are identified. The wheat would have yielded everything they're going to yield. See, I know a lot of people say, well, you know, tares look just like wheat. They do. But uh, I'll tell you something. If the wheat produces wheat, right? And all of it, all of it, because when you plant things, when you sow things, you know what season they're coming up in. So you have to get people out there to work the fields. And as they work those fields, because some people were just watering. See, the Bible, Jesus put it this way. He said, you have entered in other men's labors. One man can come. Right? And sow a seed. Another can come behind it and water the seed. But it's God that gives the increase. And what he means by that is you can labor in the field, but God determines when the water and when the seed work with the soil so that thing grows. God determines the growth of it. We don't determine the growth. Nobody determines the growth. God determines the growth. God gives the increase. He does. And so when he said that the laborers are few, there were still, you know, things had to be watered. We use the gospel to water things. Certain seeds had to be sown. The gospel had to be introduced, right? Some people who had the gospel were getting a little, you know, parched, and they had to be watered some more. So somebody, many people had to come behind and water. But there was always a time of yield coming when the fruit would come. And the fruit... The fruit is out. That's when you start to see wickedness on a collective level. Not individually, right? In sporadic places, but all over the place. And when nations authorize wickedness, the fear of the living God is gone. And it, Because if you can authorize wickedness and then turn around and use Christianity to get votes, we all know what happens. Let's not act like we don't. When you can do that to get votes, oh my you don't think that's wicked when you can act like you love the Lord? Curse somebody out. Right? Do, do all sorts of dirt under the sun. Right? And then, but for the sake of those who believe in the Lord, because you need the vote, act like you love the Lord. That, that's rotten, isn't it? It's run. Now, some people have a foul mouth. They do. And they have to get out that habit, but they have genuine hearts. You may not understand that that's called a sinner saved by grace. That means they're in the middle of a process. And you can always tell somebody who's in a process because life is not going in their direction. Don't you know that? When God is working with you, it looks like your life is falling apart. That's what happens when God is working with you. When you get what you want, God's not working with you because he does not give any of us what we want. If he did that, he would enable us to do wickedness, wouldn't he? If I actually knew what I wanted and what I needed, I would not need God's guidance, would I? I could fix myself. I could go and acquire what I need and fix myself. The truth is, we don't know what we need. We're like little babies. Babies cry, not because they know what they want. No. Babies cry because they know that they need, but they do not know what they need. Do you see that? That's up to the mother to decide. That's up to that caretaker to decide what the baby needs. So it's nothing for a woman to put the ball in the mouth, to see it get rejected, pull out the diaper, take a peep or sniff or whatever they got to do, and then see if they put the baby over the shoulder, see if it has to burp, if it's sleepy. They check all that stuff out. One of them is going to be the one. See? So just like those infants, we know that we need, but we don't know what we need. So now that you know that, how in the world, how in the world do I know what's going to fix me? The truth is, I do not. 
drive will make you think you know. But the world has turned to that type of mindset. And they're trying to prove themselves right. They don't want interference from the living God. Okay, let me get that. I'll tell you what, folks. Let me take a short break. I'm going to be back in just a minute. Just one moment. I'll be right back here in a minute. Right here at COT. Okay, everybody. I'm back and lost track of time. I did. I lost track of time. I did. I'm supposed to be down at 9 p.m. At 9 p.m. I want to tell you guys something, though. This is, uh, we have so much more to cover. We do. And as you can see, God has given us, he's given us such a word. He really has. He's given us insight after insight after insight. And if we stay true to his word, right? Not so much what I think, but the word. We can grow. We can accomplish. We can overcome. And most importantly, we won't really leave anybody behind. That's very important to me. It's extremely important to me that nobody be left behind. Right? So that brings up an issue. Problems are something that we all have. Right? And let's go ahead and face it. All of us are at different levels. We are. Guys, if you're at one of those levels where you are really you're just, you're one of those levels where you feel like you're unsure, you know, things of that nature, please let me know. If I have to put together a series of extra broadcasts, I am prepared to do that. So I can talk to you guys, help you and assist you. Now, I'll tell you right now, I cannot get you to where you want to be. I can assist you. It is the Lord who's going to get you where you need to be. And we'll seek him out together. Okay? That's where people of faith come together. Right? And we go forward. My way of truth. It, it, it really is time. And listen, tonight we discussed one of, the, one of the major signs of the end. You may not have heard it that way. Right? I'm, I'm not sure that anybody ever talks of it that way. But in my world, wickedness is one of the greatest signs. Of the return of Christ. Anybody could ever see. And because of how we're seeing it. And because of how people are. See a lot of people. They they look at different things in the Bible. And they are fascinated. By what God can do. Right? By the effects that take place in the earth. And you know that's fine. But I'll tell you something. Something about me. What blows me away. Every single time. It's when you know about a set of prophecies. And I look at specifics of people. Right? What amazes me is people end up being just as God said they would be in a specific season. That blows me away. It blows me away when people end up being exactly what God said they would be. And when he's talking about wickedness, Hmm? Wickedness? When the harvest, the harvest is going to come at the height of wickedness, we are seeing it. We're seeing nation after nation authorized wickedness. Right? Somebody in Saudi Arabia paid $3.2 trillion. And where'd they get that money from? To do something. Do you know that? They're going to draw the whole, they're going to draw, uh, uh, it's going to draw just about everything and everybody down there. Now, many projects have been started in the Middle East, but this one has been under construction for a while. And these guys are going, I mean, they're, they're doing it. They're doing it. And it just so happens that indeed a specific tribe has come on the scene. A tribe that the governments do not trust, but a tribe that's extremely rich. And through its lineage, things are happening already. 
already things are happening. And what I'm trying to tell you guys is this. Very soon, God will have revealed to us who this person of doom is. All of us, collectively, all of us. The Antichrist is going to be revealed. Right? But we just read tonight that when the Antichrist is revealed, God's children are get, going to get the victory over the mark, the number of his name, the beast, all that. And that also, because they got the victory, right? those who got the victory, those who are with the Lord, they're going to be on a sea of glass right before the wrath of God pours out. Now, based on what's happening in the heavens, because it deals so much with the wrath of God, I mean, the timing is going to be impeccable. Those things are already on their way. They're already on the way. So, this earth is going to turn into a very different place. Month by month. All right, folks. Listen. I'm not going to hold you hostage. I'm not going to do that. I won't do that. Somebody said, reveal within the next 40 days. Well, this is day one. And I won't explain what that 40 days is. Somebody keep count of the days. This is day one. And we're going to get done what we need to get done, what we need to do, what the Lord has called us to do. We need to be in position for that time. So, I want you guys to help keep track of the days. This is day one. This is day one. Okay, this is day one. Folks, listen, I'm going to join you guys again. We're going to unfold and open up more cans of worms. Many more cans of worms. We're in a part of Revelation that is very uh, rich in content. It takes a lot of referencing. And believe me, it's going to bring out quite a bit. I Look, I pray it's a blessing to all of you. I do. I pray that all of us learn something every single time we get together like this. And most importantly, that elements of your life are overcome. I do pray that. I pray that. I'm looking for that. I am looking, anticipating, and waiting for your breakthrough. I am. I'm waiting on that. So, with that, I'm going to say God bless all of you. God bless all of you. Now, I have to update the schedule for some additions this week. We missed a lot last week, so I have to make that up. Okay? I, I do that. Folks, God bless each of you. Listen, thank you always for joining me through these Bible studies. I, I do pray that all of us are picking up something useful uh, from these every single time. And if you're having an issue with your faith, your placement, but you're serious about the Lord, it's just that, uh, you know, situations are trying to tell you to keep the noise down, right? Let me know. Please let me know. I'm at a point now where I have divided the emails electronically. Uh, a system has is being put in place, implemented, so that we can check all emails every single day. Okay? Every single day. So, um... Yeah, keep that in mind, too, because nothing is more important than getting communications from you guys so that you can share exactly where you are, right? Also, be careful. Be careful, because, um, folks, I'm about the Father's business. That's what I'm about. So understand that, okay? I, I, I don't do anything else. These are critical times. If you knew me personally, you would know that I'm somewhat devoted to the Father's business. Certainly in these times. Okay? That's where my uh, mind is. I'm saying that because, well, you guys know there's some people out there who are, who try things. They're persistent. They try things. And I'm just letting them know. No good to do that. Now, listen. Any of you guys who, who, who COT, right here at COT, the Council of Time.com is the official Council of Time.com, right? I'll say that again. CounselofTime.com is the official counselofTime.com. It's the only place where you can find any content that I ever put out there. It starts right here. If you find that on another website, those guys are doing things by themselves. Right? You won't find me out there. You'll find me here. There have been certain places who, who do copy the audio 
from Council of Time, and they replay it like daily excellence, who, by the way, is quite excellent at what they do. God bless them for doing that. All right? But everything we do here is at the Council of Time. Right? If you have, if you have tried to help Council of Time by giving to somebody else, we did not get it. I had to tell you that. That's just the way it is. We, we didn't get it. The only way we get it is if it's given here. Okay? That's the only way we get it. So keep that in mind. And God bless each of you. I'll see you next time right here at COT. God bless.